I'm Rahman Khorenfer for your PhD student. We are going to talk about um, uh, about the, the implementation of optimization problems in C++ and CPLIX. In particular, we are going to get familiar with the implementation of column generation and Bender decomposition, which is a kind of cut generation algorithm. So without further ado, let me share my screen. Okay, is my screen visible, Tianjin? Okay. So in the first part of this tutorial, we got familiar with the C++ and why we are using C++ um, in this tutorial, and then why we are using CPLX. We saw an example uh, transportation problem. We saw the different versions of this uh, transportation problem with different varying degrees of automation. We also learned how to set up CPLX for the C++ environment in the Visual Basic um, IDE. And get familiar with some of these basic um, commands that relates to, to C++ and CPLX. So for example, we learned that ILO environment is used to create a modeling environment. Model, ILO model is to create models and so on and so forth. We also get familiar with some of these other commands here in this tutorial, we are getting to know what we can do about this get tool. How can we get the tool information out of a constraint? And also we are getting familiar with the get ray uh, functionality of the CPLX. Um, obviously there are much more to this small set here, uh, but again, our intention is to cover the bare minimum for, for all our practitioners to start using C++ and CPLX. So, um, column generation and bender decomposition. Let's start with the column generation. Um, we are going to, to implement column generation to a very simple problem called cutting stock problem. This is cutting stock problem is like a hello world of the column generation algorithm. It is, it is the first basic um, problem that, that all our practitioners start using column generation. So in a nutshell, we have a log with total length of L, and we have set of orders. Like we can have five orders, six orders, and we also have some patterns, and we will see what are the patterns and the numbers uh, about these parameters. And for each of these orders, we have a demand I, BI. Our goal is to find number of logs cut using pattern F, pattern P. So if you have, let's say 100 type of patterns, from which we can cut logs, we are interested in those that we use in the optimality. I mean, we want to know from which pattern we need to cut to satisfy this demand and to use um, less log as possible. Our intention to use um, the minimum amount of logs as possible in this in this cutting stock problem. All, uh, there are other versions of this cut and stock problem, but this is the simplest version. So, so um, let's consider this example. The log length, let's say it is 40. We have a log with length of 40. We have six orders, three, five, and six orders. For the first order, we want um, twin, four logs pardon me, 20 logs of length four. For the second order, we want 41 logs of length two, and so on and so forth. So possible patterns for this problem to consider could be something like this, 10, 0, 0. It means that from the, um, we cut a log um, in a way that um, it produces a 10 of logs of four meters, okay? We can do that. Why? Because our log length is 40, and if we cut 10 of these four meters, we can add up, we can um, use the, the entire log. For the other one, we can cut um, 20 of two meters one, right? For, for the next one, we can cut um, one of four meter, one of two meter, and two of six meter. Okay, and if we add up these numbers, it will give us uh, 14 and 18 meters. 
we used 18 meters out of this 40 in this pattern. It is not the best pattern we can use, we can define. However, it is something uh, that we can consider in our problem. So if we have a pattern like this, like P1 is, is this one in here, therefore our parameters, A parameters can be written as this one. A11 is 10, 12 is zero, and the other ones are also zero. For this one, um, A31 is one, A32 is one, A33 is two, and so on and so forth. This is the problem parameters. So in considering this cotton stock problem, we notice something. We, we notice that the number of patterns can be huge. The number of, well, for example, this, this very small example here, we can consider maybe tens of these kind of patterns. Most of them are not optimal. Most of them are not even um, useful to consider because they, they produce a lot of waste out of this, um, this total length that we have here. But anyway, they are, they are pattern. And initially they are inside, we consider them inside this, this problem here. So this is one consideration that number of patterns can be huge. Also in the optimal solution, only a small subset of these possible patterns are used. Not all of them. Maybe 100 possible patterns, but three of them, four of them, or 10 of them will be used. And the other consideration is that there is no need to generate the complete set of patterns. Why don't, why don't, why should we generate hundreds of patterns, whereas we only need four of them? So the idea is that is to start with a small sets of patterns and generate necessary ones along the way. So that is the, the main idea of column generation. Start with a small set of columns, each pattern here correspond to a column in the problem and generate patterns, additional columns uh, along the way if you need. And uh, in this problem, this particular problem, uh, cotton stock problem, we generate additional columns or additional patterns by solving a knapsack, a simple knapsack problem. So this is the framework of column generation for cotton stock. So what is the algorithm then? The algorithm for delayed column generation algorithm, this, this algorithm is called delayed column generation algorithm, is, is to you start with the initial patterns and we will see how we can generate initial patterns and then solve the relaxed master problem and get the tools. So this is our master problem. We relax the variables that are integral now. We, re we assume that they are no longer integral. They can be continuous, we relax it and solve it for the available patterns that we have. So we don't have the entire set of patterns, but we have a subset of them. We, we solve this one and get the dual information. Notice that we only have one set of constraint here. In the next step, we solve the following knapsack problem where AI is now a variable that determines the number of pieces of links I cut in the new pattern. So AI is no longer a parameter in this sub problem. It is itself is, is a variable that we need to, uh, to determine. It is a very simple knapsack problem. We minimize um, the object function subject to the knapsack capacity. This L total log, we consider it as a knapsack capacity. And notice that this AI is integer, obviously, uh, because of the nature of the problem. When we solve it and get the solution, we add the new pattern and stop when um, stopping criteria mid, which means that one minus Z star, this object function of the solve problem is greater than or equal to zero. That is where we, we stop. So let's see the implementation. Okay, I have implemented part of the code to save some time. And this is the problem parameter that we define 40 and we have six orders and these are required links and this is the demand here. This is exactly what we saw here this information. This is our main function. We recalled this information. We recall this information and let's create a vector, a set, if you will, that contains all the pattern that we have so far. So for that, we use vector 
And notice that each pattern is a collection of integer numbers. Pattern. And then we need to initialize this pattern. We need to give it some initial patterns. The way we do that is, is, is this for um, int and a length. If we divide, let's talk about this. If you divide this 40 by four, it will give us 10, right? This is total length divided by the first order length. It will give us 10. So this could be our first initial pattern, one of the patterns. If you divide 40 by two, it will be zero, 20 and so on. And the next step, we can divide 40 by six and get the floor of the number, whatever it is, and so on and so forth. It will give us a set of patterns which may not be optimal or which, which may not be very useful patterns, but they, they are at least some uh, feasible solution to the problem. So we say that um, int Uh, let's say pattern zero, new int, the length of each pattern is is the uh, is six. And we say that um, pattern zero i equals to this log length or d divided by uh, this required length. Here. Okay, and since it has to be an integer number, we take a floor. We say that std floor, uh, whatever we have here. This is our initial pattern, one of the initial patterns. And then what we need to do is that we need to feed this new pattern to the our pattern set. Let's um, print out whatever we have so far about the patterns. I have the code here to save some time. Let's see if it will if it'll give us any error. Okay, it is good. Let's run it and let's see what we have here. So these are our initial patterns. So pattern zero is 10 because we could cut 10 of four meter logs out of in, in a in a in a log that has 40 meters 20 6 5 5 and 3 this is our initial patterns so let's move on to the main step of the algorithm we solve the restricted method problem get the tool generate new patterns and check the optimality these are the steps of the algorithm so let's implement them one by one and uh, for the restricted master problem, let's see it again here. This is our master problem. We have one variable only. So before that, we need to define an environment as we saw before. And then we need to define a model that uses this environment. And then for the um, to define our variable, we need to define, say, ILO number array. It is X, let's say, environment. How many Xs do we have? We have Xs that is equal to the number of patterns. So whatever pattern do we, ha we have so far, we need to define as much variable um, as, as the, the number of patterns. So pattern size and then the lower bound for x is zero the upper bound is infinity and the type of variable is float because we assume that we are solving the relaxed version of the master problem so once we define the the decision variable let's um, define our constraints, right? 
So our constraint is, is for each I, we have six of these ones. We need to add um, th this summation to the model. We say for int and length and I low X, we saw the functionality at of the I'll expression in the previous tutorial. Okay, we traverse, we kind of implemented this summation here, and then we need to define this one. So exp zero plus equal, this pattern whatever we have here, P and I. Multiply by X of P. Um, is it clear so far? Okay, I we are implementing this constraint. Okay, and then simply after this one, we say model dot add this exp zero is greater than or equal to the of i. Exactly the same thing. So let's add our object function before the constraint. I forgot to mention the object function. So for that, it is very simple. The summation of x's, uh, we are minimizing the summation of x's. So let's say I low expression exp1 environment for again p pattern size. We need to have exp expression one plus equals x of p, right? And then simply say model as we saw before. Add again. I will minimize minimize the environment. We want to minimize this expression one. Okay, this is how we implement this line minimize summation of x's. We minimize the summation of x's that we defined here. So constraint is added. Here we have nothing to left except that we need to define a cplex, feed the model and solve it, which I already have it here. Again, we define the cplex, feed the model. We turn off the, the showing of the log we solved it, and um, we want to, to show the um, what happened in the solution, required number of locks. So let's see if it is correct so far. OK. This is, um, let's say, required number of logs. OK. I think there must be a problem here in typo. OK. Have the model we added the object function this is the constraint and let's see what happens now. oh okay i see that pattern the last pattern has something wrong in it let's see what was that OK, 
Okay. So required number of logs is so far, this is, uh, it was given error because this was infinity here. And so required number of logs so far is 23. Let's see if we can reduce this number because the whole point of using the column generation is to, is to optimize the problem. So this is our crude object function from the initial parent. However, we need to get the dual information out of this relaxed master problem. Currently, we don't have the dual information. We just simply solved it. So let's get the dual information. The way we do it is, is to use this, uh, this functionality here command, island range array. We use this one to tag our constraints because notice that in order to get the um, dual variables, we need to identify which constraint are we dealing with, which constraint we are getting dual from. So in order to that, we tag our constraint and generate, I mean, define this idle range array. Constraint, let's say, name it constraint set one. Let's say we only have one set of constraint as we have here. And for this one, inside each constraint, we say that constraint set one add this constraint here. So we kind of tag the constraint. And then we can say at the same one to the model. We name this constraint and we can add it to the model. Then now we have, uh, we know which constraint has which name. This, the first one, for example, has constraint set one. The second one has constraint set two, and so on and so forth. We will use the information to, to get the dual variables. So suppose that our dual variables are dual, let's initialize them. Bubble and number of, number of links. We have six of them in this problem so far. It could be more. And let's say for I, we simply say two alls. We name it two alls. Of I equal to another simplex, uh, simplex command get two all. From get two all of what constraint set. Set our one i. That's it. We tagged our constraints and we get the total information by this command. Okay, any questions so far? Is it clear? I mean, how did we solve the master problem and get the tool? We defined um, this one in here, this Euler range array to tag our constraints. Okay. If we want to save some space, not adding the, the same constraint one time to the constraint set, another time to the model, we can simply say, we can comment out this one and say model add constraint set one. Now that we have everything in constraint set, we can add the whole constraint set to the model. They are equivalent. Let's see what are the two variables that we have so far. Okay. How can I? Oh, we can print out the dual information that we have so far. OK, 
that these are our tool information for each constraint. We had six constraints because this i, in our case, in our numerical example, is, is six, from one to six. Now that we have all the information, we can go ahead and generate a new pattern from the subproblem. So for that, let me introduce the subproblem here. I have implemented the knapsack problem. It takes the total information and it takes a blank new pattern. It populates the new pattern and also returns the object the function. Okay, this is a very simple example. This is a very simple implementation. There is nothing, um, a new command here to explain. It simply reads the information, creates the environment, solves the problem, and returns the, the values. So let's generate, let's create a new pattern. Integer, a new hat, goal, new int, and now links. And then let's say um, double, because the object function of the sub problem could be a double um, number. It gets tool information and then it gets a blank new pattern and populates. This is the sub problem uh, function method. And the rest is very easy. Check the optimality condition and add new pattern. Let's check it. If we say that one minus this S the objective is greater than or equal to zero, we simply break from the while loop, right? This is the stopping criteria that you have. Else we say that this pattern that we had before should include a new pattern that we generated now. Okay. Any question in these a few steps? Okay, then, then let's run the model. No, okay, let's do one thing. How can I? Oh, um, okay, this one. Let's see. So this is our algorithm. It, it started from initial set of patterns. It solved the problem, uh, restricted master problem. The number required pattern in the first iteration is 23. It tried to reduce it by generating new patterns along the way. This is a new pattern generated in the subproblem. Subproblem object function is 1.1. So one minus this one is not greater than or equal to zero, which is what is required to, to algorithm to terminate. It generates other sets, sets of patterns along the way until the subproblem object function is one and then it simply prints out every pattern that existed in the restricted master problem. Okay, so this is a very small instance, very small instance, a toy example. However, if we um, apply this column generation to a real data, real cut and stock data, we will see the, the power of column generation. Any questions so far before we move to the um, other algorithm, Bender's decomposition. Okay, so we are going to apply this Bender's decomposition to a fixed cost transportation problem. Trans fixed cost transportation problem is the same as before, it's the same as the transportation problem, except that we apply a, um, a fixed cost of using special routes. So for example, if there's a transshipment between supplier S and demand point D, we apply this fixed cost. So therefore, our Y variable is a binary variable. Either we use that route or we don't use it. 
It is the same as before, except that we add this constraint here. And notice that our x variables are continuous, y variables are binary. OK? So before jumping to the implementation of benders to this problem, let's see what is the benders decomposition. For very short introduction. So assume that we have this problem, MIP. Um, x variables are continuous. Y variables, so some of them can be integer, belong to a, another set. It can be integer or continuous, binary, mm -hmm. anything. This is our problem so far. So we can write this problem equivalently as this one. Okay, this is the same as before for y variables. The other one, this we define a value function of, of, of the other uh, variable, x variable. This value function is the same as here. Notice that this one is the same as here. And uh, if we simply take this by to the right hand side, we will have this one. Given y variables, assume that y variables are given. This problem is a linear program. Okay, because x variables are continuous and there is nothing um, integer here. So therefore, we can write its dual version. Suppose that this dual variable is u, and this is its dual version. Okay, we, we did nothing here but to write down the dual uh, version of the problem. So a few notes here, the feasible version of the LP dual, this one, is independent of y, obviously. There is no, um, I mean, if you give the y, it is, it is no longer a variable, it is a parameter in the, in the object function. However, there is no y in the constraint. So the feasible region of LP dual is independent of y. Assume that for any given y, the primal problem seven is feasible. Okay, assuming that this is feasible, then um, this is another assumption. We can also assume that the feasible region is not empty and the optimal solution for the original problem can be found by implicitly enumerating all the extreme points and rays. That is a keyword. We can assume that we have all the possible um, extreme points and extreme rays for this problem. Obviously, this is not a realistic assumption, but we will use this assumption to, to, uh, to motivate Bender decomposition. So let mu hat j be the set of all extreme points and mu hat u hat r be the set of extreme rays. So then our problem can be written as in this form, minimize z such that we satisfy certain constraints. So I'm not going to the details of this constraint and why do we have um, this set of constraints, but what is important for our implementation is that the first set of constraint is called optimality cuts, this one. The other one is called feasibility cuts because it ensures the feasibility of um, subproblems. It prevents subproblems becoming from becoming unbounded. And the other one ensures that we have optimal solution for the subproblem. So by enumerating all extreme points and extreme rays, we can implicitly enumerating all extreme points and rays, we can solve this problem. So in a nutshell, um, this is uh, our master problem. We get a new y variable and name it y hat, initial iteration and solve this sub problem here. And this is the algorithm for the Bender's decomposition. We initialize with any number of y's, a, a, a feasible solution to the problem, y. LB is minus infinity, upper bound is infinity, obviously. And then while they haven't converged, we uh, we do these steps. Solve the subproblem. If it is unbounded, then get a new ray and uh, add a cut to the RMP. If it is optimal, the subproblem is optimal, we generate a feasibility cut. Um, optimality cut, pardon me. Optimality cut and add it to the RMP. And then update the upper bound and then solve the restricted master problem and update the lower bound. This is the steps of the uh, Bender's decomposition. So how can we apply this Bender's decomposition to our uh, fixed cost transportation problem? So first of all, we need to, to make sure that our problem is in the canonical form. Okay, this is canonical form minimization and all the, all the constraints are uh, greater than or equal. So then 
um, the bender is the composition sub problem will be like this. I did nothing simply using, but simply using the definition of sub problem. Notice that our uh, dual variables are alpha, gamma, and omega. This is our sub problem. Um, you can see that this S, D, S, I mean alpha, S, and gamma, D, omega, M, Y are here. And then we have minus alpha because this is minus plus gamma, this is plus, and minus omega from this one is less than or equal to C, S, D. And in each iteration, we add this constraint. Again, I simply use the definition of the optimality cut and feasibility cut um, to, to do the vendor decomposition. We, we add this, this is the optimality cut, this is the feasibility cut. And we also minimize Z. That is what we are going to, I have actually implemented the code I'm going to explain um, the, the, the procedures to, to implement. Okay, so any question from the vendor decomposition or how we how we apply vendor decomposition so far for this problem? We haven't talked about the implementation in C++ and CPLX, but that is the required um, format to implement. We need to have the model first and then implement. Okay, let's see. The code is quite um lengthy for our session so i have implemented the code i'm only going to explain it okay and the code is kind of in many ways overlaps with the tutorial one the part one of the tutorial for example the data generation and uh, this getting the data from command window are all the same as before so suppose that we have four suppliers and three demand points and our seed is 39 these are our problem setting. And we we populate our parameters and uh, fetch the data, recall the data here. Initialize Y variable. We can, I mean, initialize our problem or initialize means to get a feasible solution. Means that uh, get a feasible solution the whole problem. This is easy for our transportation, fixed cost transportation problem. We simply start with a feasible solution. And then set the upper bound and lower bound. We have the main loop here. We define cuts. That is the main point here. We define a vector. Each of the elements of the vector is a class that is called cut. Class. So let's see what is a cut. Okay, I have the cut definition here. So cut class contains some basic information number of suppliers and demand, and then it contains the dual variables, dual variables. If the um, sub problem is optimal, it will populate these variables. If it is unbounded, it will populate the other variable. It also has a method to initialize every variable that we see here. And it also has two Boolean um, variables that indicate if the added cut that we cut generated so far is the optimality cut or whether it is a feasibility cut. Now that is the information that we need for a cut. Okay, information for the optimality cuts and for, for dual variables in the optimality cut, dual variables in the feasibility cut, and whether this, this cut is optimality or feasibility. Okay, so we start our loop, while loop, while this, this condition doesn't meet, we continue. We print the required information here. We solve the subproblem. I will explain subproblem. And we give Y variables to subproblems and we generate a new cut in each iteration. We give um, this cuts to the master problem and solve. And then uh, update the upper bound and lower bound. This is the steps of the algorithm. So let's see what is our master problem. Master problem is very easy. And as we saw it here, this one. 
we minimize Z, we add optimality cuts here. If it is optimality cut, the cut is optimality. We add this one in here. These are all information that is available so far for us. And if it is optimality cut, we add the other set of constraints here. And then solve the problem and get a new Y variable. Get the values of the Y variable because we need these Y variables to feed the sub problem. So let's see what is, um, what does the sub problem do? So it receives Y variables in each iteration, solve the problem. This is simply solving the problem. It is very easy, this, this sub problem, uh, which is this one here. Solve this problem with the given Y variables. So if it is unbounded, if the sub problem is unbounded, it will generate a feasibility cut. That is what the algorithm works. If it is not unbounded, if it is optimal, it will generate a, a um, optimality cut. However, there is there is a twist here. The tricky part is that the CPLX gives the raise, the extreme raise, but it doesn't give it in a in a nice format. Okay, we can get the information about the extreme raise by this command, but CPLX um, puts all the values and variables inside a very long one-dimensional values and variables. It doesn't give us, like for example, what is the um, coefficient of these dual variables in each extreme rate. So in order to get that information, like for example, which um, of these values correspond to which of the dual variables in the array, we need to use this command here, get ID. If the ID of this U is the same as ID of this variable that we simply gave us, we simply say that new cut and the use of the ray in the new cut is the same as values here. And that is how we simply populate our new cut. Once our new cut is ready, we simply add it to the cuts, the pool of cuts that we already had. Okay, and return. Okay, and uh, let's see if it works as intended. Okay, it is successful, but let's see the running one. Okay, so we have a very small problem here. Four suppliers, three demand points. It started with the initial values. It's, so for example, in the second iteration, our sub problem is unbounded. Therefore, it generated a feasibility cut in the second iteration. It is unbounded in the middle iterations until here, for example, the sub problem was optimal. It generated optimality cut. And then once the, the lower bound and upper bound become the same, it uh, comes out of this while loop and reports the values, okay? So you see that applying binder decomposition for a very simple problem here was not very useful. We could simply solve it in a faster time by throwing it to C++, but why is it happening? For two reasons. The first reason is that our problem is not large enough to see the power of the binder decomposition. The second reason is that we simply used a very vanilla plain uh, benders decomposition. There are many variants of benders. We can add not single cut in each iteration, multiple cuts, or we can somehow act more smartly in adding the cuts. And these are the things that by knowing how to, how to get the tool information and how to get the extreme rate information, we can make our algorithm much more sophisticated. So that is about the, the implementation of benders and column generation in C++. The codes will be available in this page. I will upload the, all the codes here. The codes for the first part are already uploaded. And what we could cover more as a sequel to this tutorial, we could solve more examples and see more techniques 
like the parameters of the CPLX and uh, some more advanced examples. Obviously, I I, um, I try to make a trade-off between the time th that we have and, and the information that we can receive. And we could uh, implement some advanced, other advanced methods like branch unbound and branch and cuts. Um, the other line that we could take was to speed up code by compiling in a really small or on the Linux. Compiling codes on the Linux environments greatly speeds up the sometimes algorithms, which we didn't cover any of these here, but these are the potential topics for, for another CPLX and C++ um, session. We could use CPLX callable library, like for example, in each, um, let's say we are using a branch and bound algorithm. In each node of this branch and bound, we can get some useful information by this callable library and perform some task. And lastly, we could um, have some parallelism and multi-threading and see what you can use um, to, to run our code in parallel environment if possible. And thank you so much for attending. And uh, um, I have uh, we have time for some question and answer. Uh, okay, thank you, Raman. Um, if uh, any of you have questions, please feel free to raise it up. Um, I think we have one question in the chat. Um, Kamlesh is asking if you could please share some resources for learning optimization techniques. Okay, learning optimization techniques. So the point is that um, there is, I cannot think of any any source that, that gathers all these techniques in a very nice format. For example, there are some papers or tutorials about column generation, um, but um, I don't know any, any good resource that collects all these uh, advanced algorithms like column generation and benders. I mean, in, a, in an advanced way, the simplest forms are available in tutorials and in everywhere, but in advanced way and giving some more insights are kind of scattered along many resources and many tutorials. Kamlesh. But send me an email, Kamlesh. I can give you some resources about column generation. I don't see the chat box or... You still see my screen, don't you? Okay. Yeah, we do. I hide it, the, the floating panel. I don't know how to get it back. Oh, okay. Hmm. Others here. In terms of those coding optimization, uh, what resources do you recommend? Say it again, Tianqing. Uh, in terms of coding for those optimization problems, what resources do you recommend? I mean, in any language. Oh, any language. If you are going to, to the serious operation research, CPLX, C++ and CPLX or C++ and Groby would be the best option. But if we have some data analysis or a considerable amount of data analysis in our code, I recommend to use Python because I mean, there are great resources and tools in Python for data analysis and uh, refining data, cleaning, and the feeding of a model. But if you want some speed and quickness in your code, some, you know, a, a language that most of the OR practitioners are familiar with, that is C++. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions from the audience?
Okay, I can. I think we can call it today, Tianqing. Okay, thank you everyone for joining and thank you. And uh, we we we've seen the last couple of uh, examples from uh, large scale uh, optimizing linear programming problems. Uh, in particular, we saw those uh, uh, tricks implemented well in uh, C++. And uh, and thank you again for for having your time here in attending our events, especially during the the exam period exam time, the term exam time. Once again, uh, we thank Raman for uh, giving us, giving us such an amazing tutorial.